Good morning and welcome to New Life East. I'm Patrick Bukowski and I'm glad we're able to worship together today as a church family, even though we're only doing this together virtually. Today, is it's hard to believe this is our 11th Sunday online and I'm sure we're all looking forward to the day when we can do this in person again. The things we've been mentioning each week are still true today. If you'd like to engage or communicate with us, you can use the buttons in our app, at enewlife.com or click the links below this video. If you're on social media, we'd love it if you'd like or share this celebration video to help us get the word out about East. As you may have heard in the e-news, we are targeting June 7th as a date to begin offering some in-person gatherings again. TJ will have more to share, but I know how many of us are looking forward to that. I did want to mention this. We are committed to serving the whole church body well for as long as this season lasts both in person and online. Whatever your circumstances are, we're thankful for you and are aiming to do what's necessary to help you participate in the life of the East Campus. And that's all I got this morning. Let's sing together.
Good morning. I want to just mention what we have coming up. Uh, a couple of weeks from now, we're going to go back to having a live um, Sunday morning worship gathering. And we are going to get that started on June 7th. Just two things I wanted to mention about that. Uh, the first is that we anticipate a very slow roll. And so some of you watching this might be thinking, no way I'm coming back on June 7th. And others of you are thinking probably can't wait. So those who come, uh, it's going to be different. And Steve's uh, sharing about that right now on a weekly basis in the E! News. So catch those if you haven't. But the other thing we wanted to kind of emphasize is that this here, this uh, video uh, available worship experience on Sunday morning is going to continue. And so our plan for Sunday mornings going forward is going to be to have this, and it will actually stay very, stay very strong and probably continue to improve uh, for an extended duration. And we'll add back the live Sunday gathering, and the two will complement each other. And so Sunday mornings, that's the big picture plan. If you'd like more information on the details, uh, go check out the, the two E! News emails that Steve has sent out the last two weeks. He talks about it more there. Well, the sermon this morning is about the truth, the central truth claim of Christianity. If you had to boil it all down, the message of Christianity is the message of the cross and resurrection. The Apostles' Creed says it very clearly and succinctly. It says that Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. And on the third day, he rose again. More than any other thing in the whole scriptures, Christianity is about that thing. What happened on Good Friday and Easter Sunday. So as we've been in this series, taking a look uh, from 10,000 feet at the story in the Gospels of Jesus' life and ministry, we're going to spend our last two weeks taking that same kind of look, uh, from 10,000 feet look at the cross, and at the resurrection. This morning's a real simple sermon and a real simple message. I hope it'll be a good one for those of us who are um, experienced and maybe steeped in the Word and Christianity. I also hope it will be good for those um, who are new to the faith, who may just be happening to check this out, and even for our, our, our young people, that it might be a good sermon with a simple message about the cross, and it's this. That Jesus, who was the king, became the king who went to the cross. And we are saved by what he did that day. Jesus, who was the king, I've been talking about that every Sunday, his message that the kingdom had come, became the king who went to the cross. And we are saved by what he did that day. Well, he suffered under Pontius Pilate, is what it says in the Apostles' Creed. Who is Pontius Pilate? Well, Pontius Pilate, who uh, we're going to just call Pilate from this point forward, is, uh, was the military governor of Judea at that time. He was in charge of the Roman occupying army in Judea. So as the Roman Empire had spread, they would have in each region a, 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 a military ruler, they would call him the prefect or the procurator. A big title for a big guy with a big job who had big authority. Pilate had full control over that region. And that is probably most clearly seen in the fact that he was in charge of all of the troops that were there. They, there's an estimate that, that there was a cavalry of maybe 120 horses and a, an infantry division that was several thousand troops strong there in Judea. And they would move around in the region based on what was going on. And so um, Passion Week, and where we will pick this up, uh, this conversation happens very early on Good Friday. Uh, Pilate had actually come to Jerusalem from where he normally lived, which is in a different, different city called Caesarea. But there was a... There was a um, castle. It's not the word I'm looking for. He had a, a large headquarter home 
in Jerusalem, where he would come when it was going to be the feast times. And so this was Passover week, and they were all kinds of people that came into Jerusalem. And to make sure that there was not going to be any kind of uprising, to make sure there was not going to be any trouble, um, Pilate was there, and he had also brought more troops with him. And he did that at the major feasts throughout the year. In Pilate's role, he was able to bring his wife with him to wherever he was posted. Uh, and he lived a life of authority, uh, being received with fearful respect. Not loved, definitely feared, and able to live his life in relative luxury. But in Judea, Pilate had had trouble. He had had trouble with the Jews, especially with their leaders. And so um, I'm not going to tell the whole story and the things that um, the historians tell us about Pilate, but he had um, sort of gotten into a sour relationship with the, the people who were occupying the Jewish people and their leaders, who in, in the Gospels were talking about the scribes and the Pharisees, those who were those same people had developed a real tense relationship with Pilate. That brings us to our text. That's kind of the background I'm going to give this morning. If you'd turn with me in your Bible to John chapter 18, verse 33. John 18, 33. The whole story of Pilate and his interaction with Jesus, what he says, and then going back and forth between Jesus and the Jewish authorities and the crowd. In the book of John, that, that takes up almost an entire chapter. It's, it's John 18, verse 28, all the way through John 19, verse 22. And we would just uh, be doing too much to try to take all of that today. And so we're going to focus in on one aspect, one portion of that, 13 verses actually, from John 18, 33 to John 19, 5. Read with me, if you would. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? And Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not of the world. Sorry, is not from this world. And then Pilate said to him again, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. Uh, another way to translate that in some of our other translations, get this sense of it, which is, he says, you say rightly that I am a king. After being brought to Pilate, Jesus goes inside with him, away from the rest of the people who brought him there, away from the chief priests, and away from the, the Jewish authorities. They have brought charges. They do not have the authority to crucify. They do not have the authority, actually, to execute somebody who is of significance and of prominence. That right is reserved to Pilate. And, and they were very intent on crucifying Jesus. They were very intent on seeing him extinguished and put to death. But they didn't have the ability to make that happen. Pilate had to make that happen. And so after he had been arrested and tried by the chief priests in the Sanhedrin, the Jewish authorities, they had their trial. They considered him guilty and worthy of execution. And so they brought him to Pilate. After getting a sense of things and a lay, uh, an understanding of the lay of the land, Pilate enters his headquarters and talks directly to Jesus and asks him, are you a king? And here in these verses that we just read, verse 33 through verse 37, Jesus confirms to Pilate that that charge just leveled against him is true. Pilate says, are you a king? Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus speaks about his kingdom. And then he says to him, you say that I am a king, or you rightly say that I am a king. 
Pilate's trying to figure out if Jesus is worth putting to death. He's trying to understand if he's an actual threat. The Jewish leaders had tension with him. He had tension and really some disrespect and scorn for the Jewish leaders. He was not necessarily interested in taking care of what it was they brought to him that day. But a challenge that was going to rise up and call himself a king, a challenge that might rise up and be looking for authority that would be pulling people away from the authority of the empire and from the authority of Caesar and therefore from, from Pilate's role as the military governor in the region. If Jesus was a threat there, that's what Pilate was looking for. But Jesus is talking to him in answer to his questions and saying to him, my kingdom isn't that kind of kingdom. My kingdom is not one that is, you know, going to rise up in rebellion and, and, seize a, and have a coup. If that was the case, then my, my followers would be fighting, but they have not been fighting because my kingdom is not a kingdom of this world. Jesus' kingdom is what he came into his public ministry heralding. And we've kind of talked about it each week through this series. It's a continuing theme of his ministry. It's been a continuing theme of this series. And it continues all the way to the cross. Because when Pilate is first examining Jesus, he wants to know about the claim of kingship. Going on from there in verse 37, uh, Jesus says, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Jesus tells Pilate, I have a reason for being here. It's not to establish a kingdom that is going to seize land and have a military coup. I, I am here to establish a kingdom that's not of this world. My purpose is to bear witness to the truth. And when you think about it, Jesus had borne witness to the truth, the truth of who his father was and sent him to do, the truth of the kingdom that God had promised in the Old Testament and was now bringing into the very first fruit of, of existence uh, in a new way under the new king. Jesus had been, had been bearing witness with his life, through his teaching, with his miracles, and even in his disciple-making. But looking forward and knowing what is coming, he will continue to bear witness to the truth on the cross. This conversation is taking place on Friday morning, and Jesus tells Pilate that he has a purpose and a reason that he has come to bear witness to the truth. He is saying, as he speaks to Pilate, that for the rest of that day, as he does the work that he will do on the cross, the work of enduring and suffering and taking upon himself the suffering and sin of others who would come and put their trust in him, as he turned to do that, he would be bearing witness to the truth. I've come into this world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Now to all of this, the conversation about his kingdom and Jesus uh, telling about his purpose to bear witness to the truth, Pilate has sort of a throwaway. He says to him, what is truth? In the past, I've thought of that as a, as a, a real exploration question. Perhaps like, like Jesus talking to Nicodemus when Nicodemus came to Jesus under the cover of night. You know, he was one of these, um, he was one of these Pharisees who was part of the ruling class and, and he was curious, personally exploring if Jesus was who he said he was, if he was the Christ, if he was the Messiah. That was Nicodemus and he actually, Nicodemus has a, a, a place he comes up in the story of the Gospels again here, right at the very end, because he and Joseph of Arimathea are the ones who took Jesus down off the cross and put him into the tomb. So when Nicodemus came to talk to Jesus, he was coming with, general, with genuine uh, heart for exploring who he was. But what I learned this week as I studied is that Pilate wasn't that kind of guy. Pilate wasn't that kind of guy, and he wasn't interested in Jesus in that way. He was simply interested in his authority. He was simply interested in doing his job and keeping power. Because he had had trouble 
since he had been in charge there in Judea. He knew that he was on, um, he was on probation in some ways. He had actually been sent back to Rome to give account to the emperor in Rome about one of the uprisings and how he dealt with it militarily that had happened in Judea in the first couple of years he was there. Um, another Roman official caused him to have to go back. Caesar sent him back to continue his work in Judea, but obviously if you've been sent back to, to account for yourself, then you know you're kind of walking on eggshells. So when Pilate said to him, what is truth? He, he, he's not asking and thinking, I want to find out more about what this Jesus has to say. He's just kind of like, what, 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 is, what is this even about? What are we even talking about here? Going on in verse 38, it says, After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. But you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a robber. After Jesus and Pilate have this conversation, this examination inside, um, Pilate's convinced that he's not the threat that he needs to be concerned with. So he goes out and he, he says that, and he tries to let the Jewish leaders save face by saying, you know, I do have, you do have this custom that we, we release one prisoner at Passover. So um, saying to the, the, the crowd that was assembled there with the, the leaders of the people, but also the, the people who had gathered, he said, do you want me to release Jesus? Thinking that he would win with the crowd and that the, the leaders who had sent him here for their uh, hoping to have him crucified would be happy enough with having him tried and released that he could settle the whole thing down. But of course, they say, no, we don't want to have Jesus back. We want you to release to us Barabbas. It's interesting that when Pilate tried Jesus, he found him innocent. And yet he still convicted and sentenced him. Let's see how that happens. Chapter 19, verse 1, Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. And they came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold, the man. And if you have your Bible open, we're in um, verse 5. If you would just look ahead with me, the pronouncements that Pilate makes of Jesus to the crowd as he goes from having said he's innocent, do you want him back? All the way to saying, I wash my hands, I'm innocent of this man's blood, take him away to be crucified. He says, behold the man. In verse 14, he says, Behold your king. Shall I crucify your king? And then in verse 19, while Jesus is on the cross, Pilate writes an inscription that is hung above him. Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. All the way through this, the scribes and the Pharisees and the chief priests, they, they keep pushing back, especially with what he put on the cross, saying, no, we don't want that to be here. Don't, don't write that up there. But Pilate says, hey, what I have written, I have written. And in Pilate, you have somebody who is drawn into this drama, drawn into this narrative, who, who had problems of his own. He had concerns about his, his continued authority where he was. He had a wife, it says in, in, in um the other gospels who came to him and said, I've had a dream about this man. It had nothing to do with him. And yet he had to deal with this. He had to dispose of this issue. That, that's just who Pilate was. He was the guy who was there to make sure there wasn't the next uprising. And Jesus before him was only a chance for him to do his job and get on to the next day. But in the providence of God, 
And in the whole story of the whole Bible, it is very significant that Jesus comes to the cross being found innocent by the Roman authorities. There really was no reason for him to be crucified, and Pilate said so. But the chief priests, they kept going, they kept going. They stirred up the people so that the whole crowd together was unwilling to see Jesus excused. They all were intent on seeing Jesus be killed. Jesus came and he was the king. And yet he went to the cross. He came to go to the cross. On the cross, Jesus died in our place. And he died for our sins. Now, those are the two most basic things. And so many of you, when you, when you hear those things, like, well, yes, that's, that's, our, that's our faith. He died on the cross in our place for our sins. When you look back, though, to the most well-known, famous Old Testament prophecy about Jesus in Isaiah 53, you just hear this foreshadowed and, and echoed ahead of time through the prophet Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus. In Isaiah 53, verse 3, he said that he was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. As one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. But surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken and smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have turned, gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The prophecy in Isaiah is of one who would be pierced and punished for the sins of others. And Pilate, even as he just kind of disposes of and deals with the situation of this, this next problem that was brought to me, I, I think he's innocent and I want to see him not in here because I don't see there's any reason to crucify him. But there was such pushback. There was such pushback that he had to go the way that the Jewish leaders and then the Jewish people were all calling for him to go to see Jesus crucified in fulfillment of what God's word had said from the Old Testament, in fulfillment of what Jesus himself had said was going to be the way that he lost his life, what Jesus himself said was going to happen. But it's almost with a tone of indignation that, that we hear Pilate say, Behold the man. In John 19, 5, he had had Jesus flogged, so whipped and beaten. The soldiers had put a crown of thorns upon his head. Big thorns, sharp thorns, not, not like little one inches. These, one of the things I read said that these, these, these thorns could be up to 12 inches. I can't imagine that. But it was a thorny thorn crown pushed into his head. A purple robe put upon him like he were a king. And he says to the crowd and to the people, Behold the man. Going on a little bit later, behold your king. There's exasperation in the way this thing continues to move forward. He says, shall I crucify your king? And then he delivered them over, delivered him over to be crucified. When he did, he took the step, not a usual step, of writing an inscription that would be hung on the cross above Jesus. And it said, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Jesus went to the cross, even still, unwittingly proclaimed to be the king. But Jesus went to the cross to pay for the sins of others, bruised for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. 
So there's two ways for us to respond to this message. And in Christian history, through the 2,000 years, there have been two ways to respond to this message. For each one of us, where we are today, living and, and, and sitting, listening, watching, there are two ways that we respond to this truth. Jesus dying on the cross in our place for our sins is the center of Christianity. It's the whole point that that Jesus came and died as a substitute, sacrifice for those who will turn to him in fulfillment of what had come before him. Three days later, he rose. Excuse me, on the third day, he rose. But he died on the cross And we respond to that one of two ways. We respond in repentant faith or we respond in ignoring, in minimizing, disqualifying for our own selves. It's not really, it's just, it's not true or it's not true for me or, hey, yeah, it's true, but the way I live my life, it's not true for me. And if you're uh, someone who has not responded in repentant faith, I ask you to do it. I encourage you to do it. I beg you to do it. Jesus died on the cross. His death on the cross was for you. But I want to speak to the Christians there. You know, your life has opportunity today to go one of two ways as it relates to Jesus and what he's done for you. Jesus the King. Behold the King. Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. You can... You can look to him and having trusted him and belonging to him, you can follow him. You can follow him and you can can just kind of throw things to the side, beat beat a strong path right down the middle, right to Jesus. You can go the other way too, even as a Christian which is to live with your life, in your heart, your mind, in your relationships, in the way you handle and process the world you're dealing with today, ignoring him. But he suffered under Pontius Pilate for you. I encourage you this morning to think about your way to live, the way you have lived, the way you will live. He was pierced for your transgressions. He was crushed for your iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought you peace. Enthrone him as the one for whom you live. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you, Father, for the cross. Pray we'd have grace to trust you and to enthrone you as our king. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Above every other name, 
It's Memorial Day weekend. Memorial Day, we stop not just to have the day off. We stop to remember those who have fallen in service to this country in military battle. If you're remembering somebody who is precious to you, who has fallen in military battle and you lost them, we're thankful for your sacrifice. I just want to pray together around that. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you that you are a God who comforts the afflicted and who can mend the soul when we have hurt. And so for those who are, are missing somebody this week and are feeling their loss, pray that you would give them encouragement and grace and comfort in this time and that, the, that today and tomorrow, that this would be a special weekend for them that is filled with the hope of Jesus. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let me leave us with the last word from God's word from Isaiah, where we were earlier. That he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and by his stripes we are healed. That's a good word. By his stripes, we are healed. Have a great Sunday.